was flabbergasted. And I went to a geologist at my university named Peter Gromay, and I said, can you answer this for me? And he looked at me, and he laughed at me. And he said, you damn biologist, you never studied. You never took a course in geology, did you? And I said, well, no, as a matter of fact, I didn't. And he says, well, here's the answer. Uh, first of all, you should have taken a course in geology. <laughs> secondly, secondly what, you, what geologists are aware of is that the Earth's magnetic field reverses periodically, and it fluctuates back and forth, and has so for millions of years. When a rock is formed from molten lava, it keeps in the rock a very, very weak remnant of the strength and the direction of the magnetic field at the time it was formed. And we actually, we actually call that paleomagnetism. And the paleomagnetism in the rock enables geologists to some degree to uh, uh, date magnetic field reversals and also to know how early or how long ago uh, molten material spread on the ocean and on the, on the surface of the Earth. It turns out that if you take the real data, from Earth magnetic field fluctuations. You can see it fits right into Barnes's curve, but shows a record that's been fluctuating up, down, up, down, up, down throughout recent human history. And in fact, the present fluctuation we're in is actually a rather mild one, and it may begin to reverse and increase in strength as well. But it's hardly a proof for the Earth being young. In fact, when you look at the real evidence, it's proof for the Earth being really very, very old. The moon <laughs> argument is my favorite, and, and uh, none of the astron all the astronomers I talked to knew it was wrong, but they didn't know why. And in desperation, um, I wrote uh, uh, someone who's actually, whose name is on the letterhead for this group, Carl Sagan, uh, who I think is at Cornell University and has some other activities as well. I didn't know how to approach Carl Sagan. I figured he would ignore his mail, so I had two aces up the hole. Uh, one of which is I went to, uh, uh, I grew up in a town called Rawway in New Jersey, and I went to Rawway High School. So did Carl Sagan for two years. So I said, we're fellow graduates of Rawway High School. And when I was home once for Christmas, I were having dinner at my aunt's house. And I mentioned Carl Sagan. I said, wasn't he there about when you were a student? And my aunt said, yes, I dated him once. <laughs> uh, and then I, then from a, a story that I will not reveal, having the inside story on Carl Sagan, it was easy to go ahead and ask a favor. <laughs> and um, actually, actually, Dr. Sagan was quite obliging. And he sent me back a handwritten letter within two weeks. Uh, I should see what was in my letter. A handwritten, a handwritten letter saying where to find the right data. And it turns out that NASA did a tremendous amount of work uh, preparatory to the moon landing to anticipate what might be there. And one of the things they were concerned about was the layer of dust on the surface of the moon. Well, the moon is covered with a layer of dust. It's called the regolith. They even have jargon for it. And this is from a journal which talks about its activities and so forth. The regolith is 5 to 10 meters deep. And its composition is about 1% meteorite dust. In the early days of the <coughs> space program, both this country and the Soviet Union were worried, and you can see this in science fiction movies in the 50s, we're both worried that if we sent spaceships up, they'd be punched full of holes by meteorites and the astronauts would die. So one of the first things that was done in the late 60s was to measure meteorite impact. And all the early satellites had instruments to do that. The rate of dust accumulation is about a thousand times less than estimated in that 1960 Scientific American article. And the reason for that is that the Swedish scientist who did it estimated meteorite flux on Earth by measuring nickel in the atmosphere. And nickel is found in very high abundance in meteorites. He thought it'd be a good marker. It turns out that nearly all terrestrial nickel in the atmosphere is released by iron processing in the Ruhr Valley in Pittsburgh, around Tokyo, and therefore there are terrestrial sources for this. And when you get up into space, you discover that the rate of accumulation of meteorite dust is almost exactly within 2% what you'd expect for a moon that was 5 billion years old. So when you look up the argument that initially you get annoyed at, what you discover is another consistent evidence for a certain age for the Earth and the solar system, which is very consistent with evolution. And finally, with the Paluxy tracks, Fred showed a slide like this, but this actually shows the details that you need to look for. You can show that the tracks are carved, and the tracks are in limestone. Limestone is a layered sedimentary material, and authentic tracks made by a real organism pushing down on the wet mud and the layers show a depression in the layers and a welling up of mud on the outside. If they've been carved, then the track cuts right through the stratification layers, and all tracks of humans, uh, human-like tracks that have been sectioned show exactly that characteristic. Lori Godfrey at UMass, uh, uh, UMass Amherst has done a wonderful investigatory job on the tracks and has exposed these things very nicely. But again, if you're going to debate a creationist, you've got to be prepared for that. The third lesson is correct errors. There's nothing that makes it a more important impression in the debate than catching your opponent in an error, intentional or unintentional, and showing how the real data works. The first time I debated Henry Morris and brought up the very famous Miller-Urey experiments in which a spark discharge was used to drive the undirected synthesis of a host of organic compounds, 
and use that as an example for how the inflow of energy could build up complicated organic compounds necessary for the evolution of life, Morris countered by saying that there was something that Stanley Miller and Harold Urey didn't tell anybody, and that was that there was a trap built into this apparatus, a chemical trap, which pulled these compounds out as quickly as they were formed. Because if they were not, the undirected application of raw energy would have torn them apart. There'd be no such trap and no organic chemist to rescue the compounds on the primitive Earth. Therefore, things like this would never happen. Well, when you hear that the first time, if you're a biologist, you haven't read this paper. You're not sure what's going on, and you just sort of let it pass. Then a week later, you go into the library, and you pull the paper out, and you read it. And then you read it again, and you read it again, and you read it again, and you can't find a trap. You call up Stanley Miller, who is still around out in California, and you discuss this with him. And he says, well, the only trap that existed there in any sense was water, which trapped the compounds as they were circulating through the reflux, and water that was designed to simulate the primitive ocean. And what you do then is the next time you have a debate with one of these nice folks, and they pull out the trap, you've already got your trap. And you can tell them the paper is here, and you can concoct a theatrical gesture. Remember, debates aren't science. They are theater, and they are public debates. And you take a copy of the paper with you, and you hand it to Dr. Gish, and you pat him on the shoulder, and you say, read up. <laughs> the fourth lesson is you attack. And Fred brought this out as well. Uh, this is, the, uh, I think, the single most important book for any person who wants to debate creationists to read and understand. It's not the one they push most widely, but it was Henry Morris's first big book, The Genesis Flood. Now, the reason for this is that the central point to a biologist on which creationists and evolutionists differ on natural history isn't whether there was a creation event so much. The central point on which they differ is what formed the geological formations of this planet. Where does the fossil record come from? To creationists, all of the strata in the fossil record come from one event, which is the Genesis Flood, which put fossils and living organisms in the record or the stratified record that we see them, and unfortunately created the illusion of evolution. And as Fred pointed out, you have to bring that model out and you have to explain it. And the reason you have to do it is because it's silly. And when you bring this out, it sounds silly, it looks silly, it gets a laugh out of the audience, and it exposes the intellectual bankruptcy of the theory. It also exposes, incidentally, why the flood theory was abandoned by serious creationists almost 100 years before Charles Darwin. And creationists, prior to Darwin's time, had already realized that it was impossible. Here's how you show it's impossible. There's a place called Amethyst Mountain in Yellowstone. There are similar places like this out west, in which there are beautiful petrified forests. And the woods, uh, the tree trunks in these forests were put that way by the action of uh, a recurring volcano that erupted several times over the course of 40 or 50,000 years. Each time the for forest floor covered with lava rose two or three feet, a new forest grew in, a new set of tree trunks grew up, and if you section this mountain, which mining expeditions have, you find layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of petrified tree trunks, a new forest floor, another layer of trees, and so forth. The best estimate for how long one can go between cycles of reforestation like this is about 150 or 200 years. And if you take the radiometric estimates of time between, it's more like several thousand. And what seems to have happened, therefore, is in one mountain, you have very, very good geological, biological, and radiological evidence that this particular formation is of at least 50,000 years old in terms of the time required to go from the top to the bottom. Now, 50,000 years doesn't sound like a long time to an evolutionary biologist, but when you seriously argue the Earth is only 6,000 years old, it's a serious problem. They have to explain it. And the way in which I have heard them try to explain it is to say that this was still formed by the eddies and flows of the waters of the flood. And what the flood did, as they threw in a whole mass of, uh, of tree trunks, was a few of them got stood on end. And then the next layer came in and a few more got stood on it. And therefore, what you have to do is to show the actual pictures of the site and then ask people, do you think the orientation of the tree trunks that you can see in this, and I have some other pictures in color which actually look better, uh, these are things could have been formed by random processes of a flood, and shouldn't we occasionally have found trees in all sorts of disarray? And the answer, of course, is yes, you don't see that, and you expose the model for what it is. Uh, one of the best sources of attack has to do with organisms in the flood, and Fred has already shown you how to do this. The tree trunks running to high ground is my favorite. If you're not a biologist, you may not appreciate the fact that flowering plants, almost every plant that's around in the world today, didn't appear until about 100 million years ago. They're absent from the lower regions of the geological record, and therefore you've got to explain how they got on top, and that is the trees running for high ground. Well, there are other ways to explain it as well, and I'm indebted to Porter Keir, 
who's a friend of mine at the Smithsonian, for showing me this one. This is a sea urchin fossil. Sea urchins have one of the richest fossil records of any sort of organism. And the reason for that is that if you're a sea urchin fossil collector, you don't go out and find them. What you do is you hang around and you wait for Exxon and Mobile and Shell to send you sea urchins. And the reason for that is that they do core drillings offshore and they date the layers in which they're likely to find oil by the species of sea urchin fossil. Therefore, they're delighted to make friends among people who can identify the fossils and tell them what geological period they're in. And therefore, all you have to do is sit in your laboratory and open the boxes as they come in and sort them out. And as far as I can tell, Porter's been doing this for about 30 years. Well, the interesting thing about this is that sea urchin fossils, in many cases, are beautifully preserved. This is a 300 million year old sea urchin fossil. And we have a very good idea of their fossil record. Now, you remember the whole creation model for the flood is that you produce that by sorting rocks out at different levels so that the things that can't run from the flood, all those simple slimy invertebrates that if you don't know the fossil record you tend to think of as primitive, <coughs> were at the bottom, and the things that could fly and run like man and birds and horses and stuff were on the top. Now actually that doesn't really correspond to the diversity of many fossil types as this type points out. And in fact in geological times right now is what you might call the age of fishes because the greatest diversity of fish is not hundreds of millions of years ago, but right now, in geological terms. And that doesn't make any sense if you take a flood model. But actually, sea urchins are even better. If you know anything about sea urchins on the left-hand side, you know that they're bottom dwellers. They don't move real fast. And if there is a tremendous worldwide flood that covers the oceans with great layers of sedimentation, clearly sea urchins ought to be at the bottom. Well, it turns out they're not at the bottom. Sea urchins evolved in the Paleozoic, and in fact, right now is the golden age of sea urchins, in one sense, in terms of species diversity. Now, sea urchins are marvelous creatures, and I have nothing against them, but one of the things they don't do very well is run from a flood. And therefore, it's perfectly clear just looking at the so-called geological creation model that it doesn't fit with sea urchins, and therefore you've got a real and a serious problem. Lesson five, distinguish word meanings. Nothing could be more important than this. One of the things that one is often asked is, is evolution a fact or a theory? And the creationists will tell you it's a theory. The answer, as most serious biologists know, is it's both. Because we actually mean two different things by evolution. And it's almost unfortunate, and we should probably coin a different word. We should use descent with modification for the theory part, and we should use evolution for the fact. And I'll explain what I mean. The fact of evolution is change through time. It is a fact that the biological history of life on Earth shows a tremendous progressive change from one type of organism to another. Appearance, succession, extinction, and that is a fact. Therefore, it is a fact that life has evolved. The theory is, how can we invoke a biological mechanism to explain that evolution? And in fact, when Darwin began to get, do his work, the fact that life had changed through time was well appreciated by Darwin, and his primary contribution was to come up with a biological mechanism that could explain how that had happened. And that's why it's important to distinguish between fact and theory. The reason for that is if you don't, you'll wind up with creationists who show slides like this. This is from, a, from Science, which is a reputable journal. And uh, this article appeared a number of years ago and said, evolutionary theory under fire. And I saw Dwayne Gish use this once. And he said, even within the scientific community, people are tearing evolution apart. You've got to read the article. And you've got to explain to people that in the article, the argument is not whether or not change occurred, everybody knows it has. The issue is about the pace and the mode and the tempo of change. Do species diverge by more or less gradualistic, gradualistic processes or do they diverge by rapid saltatory processes? And as any of you know, this is a debate the importance of which has risen and, fall and, and fallen and risen with time. <coughs> but it's important to put that in perspective. Otherwise, to the average layperson, evolutionary theory under fire means that evolution is in trouble. Uh, finally, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is lesson six, I guess, emphasize the richness of evidence for evolution. If you're going to debate someone, you have one uh, undeniable asset on your side, and that is that you're right. Uh, and having that on your side, you have an enormous wealth of evidence from which to draw. For example, this is a slide that I often use to show the evolution of one group of vertebrates, which is to say fish. And there are dotted lines between those groups to indicate that we don't have transitional forms between the groups. However, you can then ask yourself, the fact of the matter is we have, through time, appearances of one group after another, and we have extinctions of many groups. We have a dynamic picture. We have change through time. And when one is arguing about the natural history of the planet, change through time is all you have to prove. 
because what they're arguing is stasis. Everything together at once, a big flood that mixes it up, and a lot of stasis since then. Does that fit the geological record? The answer is no. You also have to counter the accusation, which will also often be made by creationists, that the fossil record is incomplete or fragmentary, and therefore most of our sketches of extinct organisms are really artist conceptions and far-fetched hypotheses. This is a shrimp from the Jurassic, and you can look at it, and you know exactly what the shrimp looked like. You can even imagine ways to cook it. Um, this is a, a teleost from the Eocene, and it, it fish, these fish from the Green River Shale Formation in Wyoming are exquisite. You can see everything that's there, and you know exactly uh, what's going on, and you know the right way to describe this particular organism, and even to classify it. You can show slide after slide, which will point out the richness of the fossil record and the degree of information we have about fossil, fossil species, and you really ought to do it. Because if you don't, they will be left pretending that evolution hangs on a few fragmentary bones and tooth fragments and a lot of speculation, which isn't true. Finally, um, I think the, the seventh lesson is personal behavior. Uh, and this is the final lesson. And that is that when you debate, uh, you have to act in a certain way. And what I mean by the certain way is, first of all, and I don't have to tell this to uh, people who are used to working in the public area like Fred or anybody else, but you do have to tell it, unfortunately, sometimes to scientists. And that is, you never, ever, ever pull rank, which is to say you never, ever hold your degrees up against somebody else's degrees. You never say you have more publications. You never say you're more eminent. And unfortunately, some scientists can get into that sort of thing. And the reason you don't do it, first of all, is because it's pointless to the scientific argument. You don't argue within science that way, and that's not how science works. And second of all, it doesn't look very good. It looks as though failing to win on the evidence, you have to win on credentials. And audiences, any audience, sees through that immediately. Uh, the second thing is you have to use your common sense and retain your good humor. Uh, when uh, Gish or Morris or whoever you happen to be facing makes a joke, usually they're funny and they're worth laughing at, and you should go ahead and laugh at them too. But the corollary to that last point is, wherever possible, deny your opponents the use of a joke. And Fred has made this point as well, and there's nothing quite as good as the preemptive joke. And it's a very, very <laughs> useful debating strategy. Dwayne Gish, as uh, Fred has mentioned before, and I can't remember if he mentioned this talk, and I has this wonderful slide where he'll start to ridicule evolution. He'll show a slide of a chimpanzee, and all of a sudden he'll say, oh, how did my uncle get in there? <laughs> I'm going to go on to another slide. Well, if you know that's coming, and I knew it was coming, I arranged to speak first. And I pointed out to the audience that I, I had the utmost respect for Dr. Gish, who has a PhD in biochemistry from the University of California at Berkeley. That's a wonderful school. Not very good football, but a wonderful school. And uh, one of the things that Dr. Gish and I have tried to do is to get together before the, the contest and get things over and try to have this in a friendly and upright way and concentrate on the issues, make sure you can all understand what's going on. And Dr. Gish and I uh, have known each other for a long time. <laughs> your baby pictures, but when I have baby pictures of myself, my friend, my brother, or my sister, I have trouble picking out who's whom, and I have the same problem here. Um, if you do that, Gish has lost one of his best jokes. Um, another thing that, that Gish will do is, wherever possible, if he can't anticipate a joke, turn it around and make it into a serious scientific point. Uh, Dwayne Gish likes to quote from several people who work on cetacean evolution, the evolution of whales and dolphins and porpoises, to say, that these organisms probably evolved from a cow-like terrestrial feature, a cow-like terrestrial organism. And then he has a wonderful cartoon. My wife is an artist, and I asked her if she'd sort of reproduce it. And unfortunately, she did a better job than his artist did, but it's not quite as funny. So what he argues is that if they evolved from a cow-like creature, what the evolutionists want you to believe is we've got an organism like this with udders and a blowhole and so forth and so on, and that must be the intermediate form. And it looks silly, and everybody laughs. Now, if that happens before you, what you have to do is be prepared to repair scientific damage. And you repair scientific damage by saying, yes, that's pretty funny. But when you look at the serious evolutionary record of cetaceans, in other words, you look for fossil whales and you look for fossil dolphins, do you find anything that makes sense or does it look like sudden creation? Well, if whales evolve from terrestrial organisms that have their narrows, their nose opening up front, like all terrestrial organisms do, and evolved into creatures with a blowhole, which is the way you'd like to have it if you had to surface occasionally go up and down the ocean, you ought to find intermediates where the nose, the nares, the nose opening sort of moves to the top of the head. Lo and behold, you find them. There are a series of whale-like fossils, which date from the period about 40 or 50 million years ago, which show the gradual backward movement of the nostrils from the point in front to the point just between the eyes, and then gradually to the point on the top of the head. So even where your opponent makes their best jokes, 
when you look into the scientific evidence, you can find a serious scientific case for evolution, and that blunts it. Now, the last point I want to make is that you have to be careful in these proceedings, and you have to be wise, and you have to use good judgment. It's important to know when not to debate to avoid stirring up an issue that doesn't need stirring up. It's important to debate in some cases where the creations have the other hand, upper hand. And the last point that I'd make is, in all likelihood, an evolutionary biologist or your local expert on evolution is probably the worst person to debate. And the reason for that is that those people tend to be more concerned about issues of evolutionary theory. And they're aware of the tremendous ferment and uncertainty in terms of evolutionary mechanisms. They're concerned about pointing out their pet theory and their opponent's pet theory in precisely the right light. And they tend not to have their eyes on the ball. And what I mean by that is that the ball in this case is not evolutionary mechanisms. The ball is natural history. What was the past of this planet like? And on that question, evolutionary biologists have had it answered for so long that quite literally they no longer pay attention to it. And that is the past shows descent with modification, change through time. And if you make that case and you make it carefully and with respect, to your, with respect for your audience, uh, you'll win the day, you'll make some good scientific points, and you'll have a great time. Thanks. <laughs>
which took the rug right out from under him because he was making this uh, polar distinction that you're either his type of creationist or you're an evolutionist. The, the point being made uh, is that creationists tend to strongly state the case in black or white. Either you are a creationist or an evolutionist, failing to distinguish between many grades of belief in some form of creation. And uh, Dr. Miller, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I'll try and do it quickly. The point is very well made, because one of the things that I think you have to avoid allowing your opponent to do is to set up a false dichotomy which puts evolution and atheism on one side and creation and religionism or religion on the other side. And one of the things that I found it useful to do in certain audiences, but not all, is to say, look, when I teach, I never tell my students what my religion is. Never comes up in research, never comes up in science. But it turns out I'm a Catholic. And the fact of the matter is that holding the views I do about evolution and also being a practicing member of my faith is not at all a conflict with the main line from Rome point of view of my particular church. And that's true, in fact, for most of the churches in the United States. And it's also worth pointing out that in the Arkansas creation trial case, the legal uh, name for that case based on plaintiffs is McLean versus Board of Education. And McLean is the Reverend William McLean. McLean is a Methodist minister in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he was the primary plaintiff suing the state to take the creation science law down. So one of the things I think you have to do sometimes is to deny them the comfort of saying, if you believe in God, you're on the creationist side. And point out that, fortunately, it's more complex than that. It's not necessarily so. Thank you very much. And now <coughs> I'd like to, oh, sorry, Fred. Uh, this is just going to be a quick plug. If you want a source of fast information on arguments that you can use to answer creationists, subscribe to Creation Evolution, because every issue we pick uh, specific creationist arguments and uh, show the problems with them and do the kind of uh, research and publication that we've had to do the hard way in debating these people. And, and there's a lot of people working on specific arguments or uh, specialists in certain fields uh, devote uh, their time to answering a particular creationist argument, and then that can become very useful for putting together a debate. Thank you. And now I'd uh, like to introduce Dr. Eugenie Scott who is the executive director of the National Center for Science Education and runs the operation of the national office very comfortably from her home in Berkeley, California. She has uh, developed her, her expertise in the field of medical anthropology, uh, worked extensively in Kentucky with the uh, Committee of Correspondents there, and fought hard against uh, a strong effort to introduce creationism into the uh, curriculum of local school. Dr. Scott will tell us a little bit about what the National Center is doing, and then we'll take a break and come back and continue with the program. Thank you, Wayne. I'm the commercial. Um, I see people getting up to go to the refrigerator now to get a, a can of Coke or something. I'm, I'm glad that Fred gave a commercial, too. That makes me feel a little better. This is a tough act to follow when you have what is probably on paper the least interesting presentation of the day. But it's important for us to tell you about the National Center for Science Education because they're the ones, we are the ones who brought you all of this wonderful companionship and all these good ideas. We have a series of, um, we have a set of information in the back of the room there on the table as you go out the door. Uh, we have some um, booklets from the National Academy of Science which we help them distribute. Please feel free to take them one, a one or more. Uh, we have some brochures that we'd like you to take a look at to find out more about our organization. We also have some samples of our newsletter and also some samples from Fred's Creation Evolution Journal. Please look at those, but do not walk off with them. They have these large red stickers saying, please do not remove. It's always good to remind people of that because you tend to go down a table and things get stuffed in without looking at them. When people ask me, what the National Center for Science Education is, I tell them, in a nutshell, we are the pro-evolution people, which puts us in a minority. As Mike Zimmerman and others, pe other people's studies have shown, evolution is not all that popular an idea in America today. And as the pro-evolution people, this naturally makes us the anti-scientific creationism people. You heard the quotation marks around scientific. And we stand for good science education and a solid public understanding of science. Our feeling is that the only ultimate solution 
to creationism? Is a public well educated in how science works? What is science's strengths and weaknesses? And how science is distinguished from non-scientific ways of knowing? Non-scientific ways of knowing are not necessarily inferior, but they are different and they should not be confused. The National Center is religiously neutral. Our members include everything from atheists to evangelicals, and literally everything in between. For the last six years, we have been in the forefront of opposition to those who promote scientific creationism, and it has not been an easy task. Um, we oppose the efforts of the national of the creationists for a number of reasons. Of course, scientific creationism is factually wrong. The history of the world is just not like the creationists say it is. Can I have the, the slides on, please? The creationists are obviously wrong in a number of the things that they say. Um, can you put the first one on? There we go. Uh, brontosauruses and humans did not live together in the Paluxy River or any other place. Uh, crested dinosaurs were not fire-breathing dragons, a la Gish's bombardier beetles. We didn't plan this in advance, you see. We do have some a little bit of repetition here. And furthermore, um, the continents drifted to their present locations rather than racing there when the waters of the flood caused them to break up 4,000 years ago. And besides being factually wrong, scientific creationism le leads people to erroneous views of science. Um, science cannot resort to the supernatural for explanations, and this is a constant requirement for scientific creationism. Science properly done results in a changing view of nature as we add new knowledge and interpretations to what we knew before. It is not an endeavor, as Henry Morris describes it, no geological difficulties real or imagined can be allowed to take precedence over the clear statements and necessary inference of scriptures. And there are many other objections to scientific creationism, as some of which have been mentioned and others which will come up, certainly. But what I want to tell you about today is what the National Center for Science Education has been doing to keep creationism out of the schools, I'll give you a little bit of history. The National Center got its start right here at the AAAS. About 1981, a group of men and women got together and decided that some formal organization was needed to coordinate the committees of correspondence. As many people here already know, of course, the committees are community groups in almost every state. We just had a resignation in Wyoming, so if anybody here is from Wyoming, please see me after the session. S organizations which have sprung up to combat creationism, either in the schools, at the, s at the school board level, or in the state legislatures around the country. This was the time, you might recall, when Paul Elwanger was circulating his uh, draft legislation to legislatures all over the country, and uh, of course, as we know, he succeeded in Arkansas and Louisiana in getting that legislation passed, his people succeeded. Under the leadership of Stan Weinberg, Jack Friedman, who is now running Transparencies over here, Wayne Moyer and others, the National Center for Science Education was conceived. It was supposed to provide organizing information to the committees of correspondence, uh, communicate information among them, help them find out what was going on in other parts of the country, help them avoid reinventing the same wheels and then spinning them. Such was the vision of the National Center in 1981. This vision did not come uh, to pass immediately. It took until late 1983 to be incorporated. If you've ever dealt with the IRS, you can understand why there are, are <laughs> delays and that sort of thing. Uh, Stan Weinberg put out a newsletter to liaisons from 1981 to 1983, and the first Creation Evolution newsletter came out in early 1984. Still, the National Center was a fledgling organization composed of people who could work on promoting evolution education and fighting creationism only in their spare time. And as you, uh, all people, are very aware, I'm sure, professional teachers and scientists, there often wasn't that much spare time. Stan Weinberg worked hard in 1984 and 1985 to convince foundations that the National Center for Science Education was worth taking a chance on, that we had enough people, enough ideas to make a significant difference in science education, but we lacked the resources. In 1986, the Carnegie Foundation gave us $150,000 to set up a national office, hire an executive director, that's not my salary, and institute a number of programs in teacher training, conferences, and audiovisuals. This was our first big break. Other foundations followed with additional money for other kinds of projects, and the National Center was finally launched on January 1, 1987 as a truly national organization. Still, as the old saying goes, we may have started late, but we still don't have enough money. Um, when you look at the head start our opponents have, 
one realizes we still have a long way to go to reach teachers, materials that the ICR presents to teachers, to reach children, uh, or to reach the general public. By the way, you saw some uh, slides from Ken uh, from Primal Man. The, uh, uh, that's one of my favorite creationist publications as well. We are indeed a day late and a dollar short. These are some of our publications, which are available. But we have made a start, and we're going to continue to make a difference. We still coordinate the committees of correspondence, about which you will hear in the next session. We still publish the Creation Evolution newsletter, which has had a variety of improvements over the last year, thanks to our editor, Carl Fieser, who's sitting in the front row. But we've expanded. We've gone beyond the committees of correspondence in the newsletter and being the fire department for creationist grass fires around the country. The challenge of creationism will be with us as long as people do not understand what evolution is and do not understand how science works. And that's what the National Center is all about. To solve the long-range problems of poor science education, lousy textbooks, teachers who are not well prepared in the sciences they teach, reduced emphasis giving, given to science in the curriculum and the rise of pseudosciences even in the classroom, we must have a long-range program which goes beyond the activist focus of the committees of correspondence. To do this, we have a variety of volunteer task forces, the members of which have contributed considerably of their time and energy to promote our goals. During 1987, our first year of operation, we've seen these task forces form and initiate a number of projects. As an example, I'll use the textbooks task force, although I could use the teacher training task force, of which Craig Nelson is a, and a very important member. The textbook task force has as its mission to see that our kids get solid, solid science and science books rather than factual errors and distortions of scientific method and that they do not receive when they read these books qualifications from whenever the uh, idea of evolution is presented. Some scientists believe dinosaurs roamed the earth millions of years ago is a quote from a junior high textbook. We don't want our children getting religion and science textbooks, and we don't want them getting pseudoscience and textbooks. The textbook task force has already achieved a great deal. It has, through its pre-publication review project, improved the scientific content of two biology texts for the Merrill Publishing Company and the entire line of elementary school textbooks now under revision for Scott Forsman. The pre-publication review project involves the novel idea that competent scientists should be involved in college in proofing pre-college science books for factual errors and organizational clarity. This may sound like a self-evident proposition, but by and large it is not something that is regularly done by the publishers. NCSE has volunteered to act as a broker to textbook publishers to put them into contact with university level scientists who will review their books before they're published, before this nonsense gets out to the uh, classroom, either while these books are in preparation or while, they're, while they are under review. Improving books before they get on the market is a major contribution to textbook improvement. The teachers tell us they would like some help in figuring out which books already out there are worth using. So in addition to the pre-publication review project, the textbook task force will be publishing an independent newsletter reviewing textbooks called Bookwatch. It'll appear six times a year and consist of three separate scientists or teachers who will review the same book on the same issue. And the first issue is scheduled for publication this month. You can write me if you're curious about this. Uh, activity. We have a number of other active task forces as well. Teacher training, publications, audiovisuals, meetings and conferences, public information. We're trying to set up a resource center in my office, make it the sort of place where people can write for information about specific topics having to do with the creation evolution controversy or evolution education itself. Uh, if somebody wants to know about, for example, the legal aspects of creationism, where do they go? want to have them be able to come to NCSC to write me and say, send me some articles on legal aspects of creationism or some other aspect. And this is something that we are working hard to set up. We still do this, but we need to do it in an organized fashion. Um, time doesn't allow a detailed discussion of their activities. After all, this is a commercial, and commercials are supposed to be short. Although these activities, even though I will not go into them in detail, are very important to, as my, the title of my paper says, meeting the challenge of creationism. Now, fighting these long-range battles is going to be tough, just like fighting creationism at the state legislature level or the school board level is tough. It's hard to motivate people. It's hard to keep people working on these kinds of projects. The National Center is unique among science education organizations because it does have the activist grassroots component of the committees of correspondence. But it's unique among activist organizations because it has this academic component, this national effort of the task forces as well. 
So we're someplace in between uh, the, Nash the um, National Science Teachers Association and People for the American Way. I mean, we <laughs> share characteristics of more than one kind of organization. These two branches complement one another. And uh, I keep using the word unique, but I think that's the best adjective I could come up with to describe us. In some respects, the national effort is currently stronger than the grassroots component. Uh, the next session of the symposium deals with this problem, how to organize, motivate, and keep a committee of correspondence going. This is an exceedingly important part of the National Center, and one that we hope that you will consider carefully and take home with you and help us to work. Now consider that the creationists are always saying that evolution is a religion. I've often joked that we'd be better off if it were. We'd certainly have gotten going a lot faster than we did, and we'd certainly have a whole lot more members and more resources, that's a euphemism, with which to carry out our programs. The difficulty is that people do not respond to the intellectual idea of evolution in the same way they respond to the emotional appeal of religion. I once wrote a manuscript called They Have All the Good Songs, which was rejected for publication. See, Robert Gentry is not the only one who um, <laughs> has these difficulties. The title came from an old Tom Lear song. You all know Tom Lear? Yeah. Tom Lear? Okay. Songwriter. The title of the song was The Folk Song Army, and the first verse of it, or one of the verses, went, Remember the war against Franco. That's the kind where each of us belongs. Though they may have won all the battles, we had all the good songs. <laughs> now, it's a song that the creationists may well be singing today. We evolutionists are winning all the battles, but they have all the good songs. And don't forget the legacy of the American Lincoln Brigade the eventual restoration of democracy in Spain. It took a long time, but the guys with the good songs won. They have all the good songs. The opponents of evolution have an esprit de corps that we have difficulty achieving and maintaining. We tend to be good at turning out for a crisis. We turn out when Arkansas goes to trial or when our local legislature has some nuts uh, trying to get legislation passed. We rally the troops, we go down to the school board meeting, and we stand up and we tell people, up with this we will not put. But we can't maintain it for as long, for some reason. Evolution is not a religion. All we proponents of sound science education have in our favor is logic, reason, and the fact that we're right. I'm hoping that's going to be sufficient, but I'm not really sure. It really depends upon you and your neighbors your colleagues. Dwayne Gish has 60,000 recipients of Acts and Facts. We have fewer than 1,000 recipients of the Creation Evolution Newsletter. The ICR is totally supported by donations. No grants. We ain't. <laughs> We're far from that point. If the National Center for Science Education is to conduct both the activist and the long-term foundation building activities of textbook improvement, teacher training improvement, etc. We need your help. Mostly we need help at the Committee of Correspondence level. What is your Committee of Correspondence doing? Is it active? Can you make it active? And I mean you, personally, make it active. Can you help monitor anti-evolutionist pressures in your community? Can you help with a survey that we want to conduct based upon some of Zimmerman's work we'll be speaking next? Can we help us expand this survey to a national scale so we can really find out what school board presidents feel about evolution, what newspaper editors feel about evolution, what biology teachers, how they feel about evolution, what kind of hard data are we dealing with out there, how frequently is creationism being taught today? People who come to a seminar like this, I think, are knowledgeable of the fact that evolutionism, or that anti-evolutionism, scientific creationism, is not gone. We are glad that the Supreme Court decision came out the way it did last summer, because we could have lost bad. But we didn't win. We just held our own. There's plenty of creationism around, and there's going to be more of it. The strategy in the future is not going to be the church-state separation business that they've been, that we've been able to argue successfully so far. They're going to use another clause of the First Amendment. They're going to talk about freedom of speech because academic freedom is a 
is an aspect of freedom of speech. And you get a teacher who's teaching creationism, and this person argues they're teaching creationism, scientific creationism, because this is that teacher's idea of what the state of the art of science is. Religion has nothing to do with it. We're just teaching science. And you put that before a judge, and then the judge has to decide whether this crap is science or not. Not all judges are like William Overton, the judge who wrote the beautiful Arkansas decision. More than 50% of the federal judiciary has been appointed by the current president. How much confidence do we have in the ability of the current judges to be able to tell whether the stuff that this teacher is teaching is really science and therefore this is an academic freedom issue? or whether this is really religion in disguise and is really not an academic freedom and is not a freedom of speech issue. This is going to be a tough one for us. The fight is not over by any stretch of the imagination. We need lots of help. We need your help. What can you do to support your local science teachers? If you're a scientist, can you volunteer to give a talk at a high school class or invite a high school class to your lab to explain what you do and, and how science works? If you're a parent, can you support expanding the science requirements in your community for students? What can you do? Think about it. Call us. Maybe we can give you some ideas. We also need your contributions, your money, as well as your time and your efforts. No organization can survive for long without money. We're going to be conducting a direct mail campaign later on this spring. You can get one of those obnoxious bulk mailed letters signed written by, signed by a, a prominent scientist saying, we need your help. Well, we really do. We really do. I hope that you will help us when you get that letter. I'm hoping in the future that we're going to see a new figure added to those portrayed. Oh, this is my denouement. You've got to get this slide over here. <laughs> you, you build up to a climax, and what happens? <laughs> a big pratfall. I'm particularly interested in this slide because sitting to my far right, a most unusual position, is Fred Edwards, whom you heard speak earlier, the head of the American Humanist Organization, and certainly one of the most prominent people, as well as the head of the most, perhaps the most prominent organization, fighting creationism and maintaining, promoting good science education in this country. And Fred doesn't know this yet, but he's in this slide. This is a picture Notice how well I'm stretching this out. <laughs> uh, this is being taped, and so there should be something for these poor people who are going to be buying this tape from us. Um, here we go. Thank you very much. We have here a slide from Ken Ham's book, The Lie, a picture of the cover of which I showed you earlier. Ban religion from school is the slogan of these groups. Now, of course, I probably don't need to tell anybody here that we are not out to ban religion in school. I did, I, I'm sure everybody understands that. Heck, I'm an anthropologist. I want more religion in school. The creationists don't, of course. Um, what we do not want is a sectarian religious view presented as science. I think it would be lovely if school children could learn more about religion, which is a rather different picture from promoting a particular ideology. You can certainly learn about religion. We'd be f that, that's fine, that's no problem. But anyway, in the, rather, in the polemics of the debate, ban religion from school, says the sign. And notice the people on there. Not only will you see Isaac Asimov, note the sideburns, um, Carl Sagan, next to the evolution is fact uh, podium there is, of course, Fred Edwards from the Humanist Association. Now, he probably didn't know that he was so, and the ACLU is on the other side. Now, in future editions of this book, what I want to see is another chair up on that stage. And I want to see a man or a woman in that chair, and I want to see that chair labeled National Center for Science Education. I want to get us into Ken Ham's book. <laughs> I want them to realize that this is the group that they have to cope with, uh, among these other groups who are working very, very hard to see that their nonsense does not get into our schools. And you can make that happen. End of commercial. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.